so we'll get started. Oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, for those who are not familiar with Green Venture, we are not for profit in the city of Hamilton, and we're helping community members implement greener practices in their homes and the community to make our city a climate champion. And if you're familiar with our work, you'll know that it spans across many different interests from zero waste to community gardens. Uh, we've got energy programs, green infrastructure programs, community education and gardening. So lots of stuff going on. And if you ever wanna come visit us, you can see us at EcoHost. This is our office, but also our um, kind of living laboratory of things and you can learn different initiatives about sustainability. So it's a 19th century farmhouse. Um, it's about two acres of land where we've got different gardens. And like I mentioned, different hands-on experiences for people to learn more about sustainability. And if you ever do come to Eco House, we always want to remind people about the land that Eco House is situated on. So it is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabeg, and Attawadaron nations, with the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. And we at Green Venture are, take this very serious and acknowledge that we are also part of this agreement and are committed to being stewards of the land. And we further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase of 1792 between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And today in the city of Hamilton, it, there are many Indigenous people, including the Métis and Inuit from across Turtle Island or what we call North America now. And we are committed to reconciliation and protecting the land for those that will inherit it. And we recognize that we must do more to learn about the rich history of the land so that we can better understand our roles as residents, neighbors, partners, and caretakers. But today we will be talking about tree, or tree equity and urban forestry. So before we go a little bit further, I just wanted to, to mention what uh, the urban forest strategy of the city of Hamilton talks about and how they represent the urban forests of our city. So uh, Hamilton's urban forest, according to the strategy, is resilient, contributes to the well-being of all neighbors, neighborhoods, and is valued as a shared asset. And if you're not sure exactly what urban forestry means or what um, urban forest management means, um, we can define it as part of the 2019 to 2024 Canadian Urban Forest Strategy, which defines urban forestry as the sustained planning, planting, protection, maintenance, management, and care of trees, forests, green space, along with related resources in and around cities, as well as communities, for economic, environmental, social, and public health benefits for people. Urban forests are trees, forests, green spaces, and related abiotic, biotic, and cultural components in areas extending from the urban core to the urban rural fringe. So when we're talking about urban forests, that's what we are, we are trying to explain or what we are encapsulating there. So to give you a little bit of local context on Hamilton's urban forest, First, we want to look at the status kind of of the past and to figure out where we're going. So currently, the city of Hamilton's canopy cover stands at 21%, which is lower than the average municipality in Ontario and is about two thirds of the city's ultimate goal of 30%. And in this area, if you're familiar with the topography and the geography, um, it's the Carolinian forest region. And that's a very diverse region. However, unfortunately, in Hamilton, the species diversity is quite low, with 29% of the leaf area in Hamilton identified as invasive species. And street trees are the most valued type of urban forest investment currently in Hamilton, representing a quarter of the total forest value. And despite stressors like compact soil, road salt, and limited growing space, street trees in Hamilton are actually doing quite well and thriving with 87% in good condition. And another big piece about the urban forest story in Hamilton is that 60% of the trees, which is quite off, is um, quite the average, is uh, on private property. So that's quite well established in other municipalities that a big percentage is on private property. So that involves a lot of ongoing community engagement to make sure that those trees are continuing to grow and thrive. And of course, there's always room for improvement. So currently, 
the Hamilton's urban forest program lands mainly in the fair performance category, and they are working on ways to improve this through the urban forest strategy. So it has not been approved yet. It's still in its first couple or its last couple stages before final approving, um, but it can be found on the city's website and we can provide a link to that later. And so this is a great first step towards improving the state of the forests in our city. And we are excited to see the results of the first draft soon and, and see what the council says about it. But looking forward, the urban forest strategy plan has provided a couple different pillars and the work that we do at Green Venture is hoping to also instill the same objectives of inspiring, um, act, protect, grow, and adapt. And again, you can learn more about this on the city's website and we will share a link to it as well. And there we go. And before I go any further, I do just want to plug some other amazing organizations in the city of Hamilton that are working on tree canopy and urban forestry work. So there is Trees for Hamilton. They are our partner on the Hamilton Tree Equity Project. And this team works with groups to have community members um, actually plant trees in their neighborhoods to help grow our urban forest. Another great one is Can Plant. They're our partner on our tiny forest initiatives. They've helped us uh, create two tiny forest pilots in Hamilton, and they're based out of Dugan and Associates in Guelph. And their team has also developed a native plant directory online, which you can check out, which has a lot of great resources, um, especially if you're, even if you're a novice or an expert in native plants, it's a really helpful database. And then Trees Please is another great initiative in the city. So it's a joint venture between Environment Hamilton and the Hamilton Naturalist Club. And they are working to provide individuals not only with trees to plant on their property, but also uh, public tree, tree events like tree planting events across the city and webinars and also they do their own tree inventory so lots of great work that's going on in the city beyond what we're talking about tonight and I'm sure I probably have missed other ones so if there's any other organizations that you know of in the city of Hamilton please feel free to drop their names in the chat so they can be recognized or if you're watching this recording in the comments to, to make sure that other people learn about the great work that's being done in Hamilton. So that brings us to Canopy for Community. So I just want to kind of give you a bit of a background on the programming that we're currently doing at Green Venture so you can kind of understand the puzzle pieces in which the Tree Equity Project fits in with the rest of our programming. So for the past couple of years, we've been working on this Canopy for Community Project as a way for our community to grow alongside the urban canopy, the urban forest canopy in Hamilton. And so we do this with kind of three uh, general goals. So the first one is learning. So um, as I mentioned before, Green Venture, we are actually an environmental education program or organization first. That is our main mandate. And it's very important to educate the community and bring awareness to our urban forests as it helps build the support needed to maintain and grow this vital ecosystem. So it's definitely a, a big part of the puzzle and, and why we do this work. And for some examples of work that we have done uh, uh, involving education, we do have several different programs that integrate urban forestry learning from an after school project, which you can see in that top photo on the left, uh, we had a virtual stewardship projects that people built or students built together over several weeks. And then we also do invasive species removal at public tree planting sites that we've done in the past, as well as you can see um, some spongy moth removal going on with other students, uh, high school students in the bottom left as well. And then that brings us to grow. So another big part of our program is empowering people to grow trees to populate the urban forest is very important to us. So we want our community to actually have kind of a stake in the in the issue and be able to you know point towards trees and say not only did I plant that tree, but I grew that tree from seed. So we're helping our community grow the urban forest one acorn at a time. So over the winter for our second year in a row, uh, we prepared a variety of tree starting kits. So this year we were able to give away almost 200 seeds and acorns. And in these kits, it included the soil, the growing pot, and step-by-step -step instructions on how to start these seedlings. So, or start these seeds and acorns and grow them into saplings. So 
We're hoping that individuals, families, and classrooms that received these tree starting kits will actually be able to plant some of them in the near future with Green Venture or at their property or at their sites and be able to add these trees to the canopy in Hamilton and be able to say that they actually grew that and were able to contribute that way. And then our final piece is planting. So these numbers are from last year as uh, we're just getting into planting this year, but we have held a variety of tree planting events and some of them have been community wide. Some of them have been youth focused to try to specifically bring some of this work to, um, to youth who are looking for community hours or just wanna get involved with their community. And we're very happy to say that um, last year we had over 125 volunteers volunteer with us and they were able to clock over 400 hours of volunteer time for this for these efforts. And during that time we planted nearly 1300 trees and we did a variety of species we kept the diversity up so we did at least 25 species. All native, of course, and this included the uh, trees like red oaks pawpaws tulip trees, witch hazel, and much more. And we're very proud of the community support we've received and just the overall excitement from participants to get their hands in the ground and help us dig and create these beautiful, as you can see, lush canopies that we've been able to create in Hamilton. And we're looking forward to some plantings in 2022. Uh, plus some invasive species removal. So as I mentioned before, these sites, in order for them to continue to thrive and grow, we actually do go back and monitor them and actually do some invasive species removal and weeding and mulching just to keep them growing and thriving so that they can live a long time. So there'll be more on that later at the very end. And so finally, what you're here for is so the Hamilton Tree Equity Project. So I want to, before we dive into kind of the specifics of what we found over the past uh, several, about a year now, um, about the tree equity in um, Hamilton, I just wanted to give you a bit of background information on it. So the Tree Equity Project, we've been working with Trees for Hamilton, City Housing Hamilton, City of Hamilton Forestry Department, and the University of Toronto Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape, and Design to compile a database of trees along with providing engagement and outreach to the community. And this was also along with support from McMaster University. And so the whole kind of main purpose or mission statement of this project is to improve urban forest health and tree equitable distribution on city housing Hamilton properties. And so to give you a bit of background on why we came to this, I wanted to just talk about tree equity first. So as we all probably know, trees are very important to the natural environment, but they're also vital to our physical and mental health. And they influence our lives in many ways from how we work, how we live, how we play in our communities, and just kind of how we go about life. They're very, very vital to just sustaining our lives. And unfortunately, the canopy cover is rarely distributed equally in urban areas. And uh, this quote from American Forests really dives into that more about the idea that tree city tree canopy covers maps actually end up resembling maps of race and income. You'll find that trees are abundant in higher income neighborhoods and sparse in lower income neighborhoods. And this trend still holds true regardless of population density. So. This was a, a lot in done by American Forest, but also some work done by McDonald et al. from 2021. Um, so there's lots of literature out there to learn more about this and the tree inequality issue. Um, but yeah, just to kind of sum it up, the trees and their local benefits are necessary for everyone, obviously, but not everyone has the same access to these benefits. And so we know these disparities and these impacts, unfortunately, are just going to get worse and worse with climate change. Therefore, we need urban forest plans and approaches um, to, to strive. We need um, approaches to implement now and strive for a city in which all residents have adequate nature nearby, have uh, fresh air to breathe and ample tree cover to buffer against heat related illnesses and I could keep going the list goes on and on on all the different benefits trees provide to our community. And unfortunately locally in Hamilton we're not immune to tree inequality. 
In fact, our urban core and newer subdivision developments likely have lower tree canopy cover, while older neighborhoods with larger lot sizes and older trees or those adjacent to the escarpment or our urban river valleys likely have higher tree canopy. And at this time, we just don't have enough data. We just don't know um, what's going on with mapping or inventory data to know how the tree canopy actually stacks across Hamilton in rural versus urban areas. If you read the urban forest strategy and some of the reports they've done so far, it's done by ward, which is great to kind of drill it down a little bit more, but unfortunately the wards are very big in parts of Hamilton. So in a rural area, there might be lots of trees say in ward 13, but then right down in kind of the urban core, there may not be as many, but it comes up that that's good, it's fine. We're, we, we can move on, there's enough trees here. So it's very important that we're able to kind of see a map of you know rural versus urban areas, um, parts of the city above the escarpment, below the escarpment, that's gonna have big differences, or even just across different neighborhoods. They may be neighborhoods right next to each other with vastly different canopy cover. And so that's a lot of, that's a lot of space. The city of Hamilton is very big. So how do we decide where to start? So we decided to start with a subset, which was our city housing Hamilton properties. So collaboratively, we've been working um, with our partners on this research and decided to pick specifically city housing properties um, and wanting to plant and provide stewardship of trees on these sites because we knew of the need um, of where they're located and the, the people who are, use these spaces and knew that there was a chance to really do some great work um, on those properties. So just to give you again a little more background on kind of how we've been able to go through this program and how we've gone where we are. We started with a steering committee and those were the research partners I listed earlier to communicate the findings, kind of help shape where the project was going. And then we identified the properties for inventory and planting. So again, focusing this research specifically on city housing. And this is something that's been done uh, in other municipalities. City of Toronto has done it with LEAF. Um, same idea, uh, going to city housing um, and knowing that these are areas of high need and unfortunately low urban forest canopy cover. And so being able to make a difference on these sites for the lives of the residents and enhance their social, physical, and mental health and well being through the planting of trees and improving the canopy coverage. And then improving monitoring and increasing canopy cover. So the research supports the city of Hamilton's for currently in their forest section plans to update and improve tree inventory data. So again, it's just kind of a subset of work that they're already hoping to do. So we're just adding to it by supporting city housing sites to meet the strategic goals that way. And then city housing, they have goals themselves that they want to empower um, their residents and also provide engagement and participation that supports healthy lifestyles and inclusivity and equity. So it just made sense to work together on this. And then working again with engagement with the tenants. So not just doing the tree inventory and planting the trees, but working with the tenants, hearing them, making sure that they're connected to the project and that their voices are heard throughout the research at different levels through different means. And finally, stewardship. So we don't want just to plant these trees and then leave them. We want to encourage and engage the tenants to be a part of this system and be able to actually have a part to play beyond just planting the trees, but actually developing tree care teams where they can do things like watering and weeding the areas, you know, to make sure that those trees continue to thrive and grow to, to healthy sizes and are, are well maintained that way but also helping, we can't be everywhere. So helping us identify if an issue comes up, they're able to say, hey, I noticed that the tree that we planted is not doing so well, can you come see it? And so finally, before I throw it over to Bella, I just wanted to go through kind of some of the methods. So you get an idea of how are we actually going to go through this research and get to kind of our, our final recommendations. So as I kind of alluded to before, we defined our priority study area. So first, the first way was deciding on city housing properties. 
And then from there, we selected a number of city housing properties. So we surveyed project managers across city housing and we selected 20 based on different building types. We wanted a very diverse list. So we looked at apartments, townhouses, a couple different ones, locations. We didn't want them all clustered in the same area. So we looked across Hamilton and then also the tenants that were living there. So we wanted to make sure there was some tenants already involved and engaged that could lead the stewardship, but then also that we had from families to seniors, like we had different types, so it wasn't always just the same people. Then we went ahead and completed the tree inventory data collection, so that was last year, and we did that using the, na the Neighborwoods tree inventory protocols, um, which you can learn a lot online. Uh, Neighborwoods is a, a great program that was developed by Dr. Kenny and Dr. Purik Malovic, um, and this includes looking at the where the trees are located, um, what the growing site characteristics around them are like, what's the tree species specifically, the size of the tree, and then any other conditions like the health and structure of that tree. And we were able to collect nearly a thousand data points or a thousand trees uh, over last summer using with volunteers uh, along with Bella. And then from that, we are able to actually map and put all this information into GIS and be able to translate it visually so we could see where are the spots, where are the gaps missing that we could plant some trees to really improve these different sites. And then along the way during all of these different methods, like these um, kind of uh, milestones, we also conducted different engagement with the tenants to make sure that, again, that their voices were heard. And some of the things we talked with them about was, you know, what are their values of trees? What are their perceptions of tree planting? Um, and we use this through surveys and different interview tools as well. And then we chose um, three to five pilots. So we're currently doing um, three right now for the spring and hope to do more in the future. But based on the inventory analysis and the feedback from our partners, including the tenants, we were able to identify locations. Um, we just did our first one last week and we actually planted large caliper trees. So instead of just smaller ones, we actually um, got higher gallon uh, trees to plant. That way some of the residents and tenants could start to actually feel the benefits of having those trees right from the start, right from the plantings. And we are able to get some tenants involved to actually plant the trees and talk to them about why we selected those trees and just have that ongoing discussion and dialogue. So that's a lot of background information. So I'm gonna give it to Bella now, and she's going to get deeper into the results and how all this amazing work has come together to create um, the Tree Equity Project as we know it now. So I'll hand it over to Bella. Thank you, Miranda, for that wonderful introduction. Um, just an FYI, my power did go off as this, I'm from Toronto, so whoever's here are feeling the effects of the storm right now. So please bear with me. I'm just uh, kind of on through my phone. So if I cut off for anything, please let me know. Uh, so yes, let's get into the results. So after completing a detailed neighborhoods assessment, a total of 951 trees were inventoried across 20 city housing properties. And to give a visual representation, we created maps of each property, including the current placement of trees um, and other relevant land uses, such as railways, rivers, playgrounds, et cetera. So we have two examples shown here on the slide. Uh, sites range from having zero to 206 trees inventoried on their properties. Properties uh, were diverse with varying characteristics from large lots like Pine Grove Place that had 206 trees, as you can see to the left side. Um, and then to the right side, we have small urban sites like 19 uh, Main Street West that had zero trees, which you can see in the top left side of the property in the second photo. So the property characteristics, including the size of the property, proximity to uh, other buildings and adjacent to green space, impacted the characteristics of the canopy coverage or lack thereof. And in the results, we'll discuss tree height uh, and diameter at breast height or DBH, the type of species found on city housing properties, the current uh, conditions of the trees, the conflicts there or will be encountering and our city housing tenant survey. So for tree height and DBH, uh, so tree height and DBH can help determine how much light can make it to the ground underneath the volume, biomass and storage of trees. Uh, so 10 diameter classes or groupings were established as you can see in the top figure here. 
So many trees, about 300 inventoried, fell within the 27.1 to 36 centimeter diameter class. The figure shows a right skew distribution as the number of trees decreases as the diameter class increases in size. Many trees inventoried were likely planted at the same time the city housing properties were built, so anywhere between 30 to 50 years ago. And as such, it is reasonable to expect the diameter class of the majority to fall within this 27.1 to 36 uh, centimeter range, as uh, that is the indicative of, uh, indicative of the age of the trees. Similarly, tree heights were grouped into classes to determine the total number of trees found in each class. The figure in the bottom exhibits also a right skew distribution with most of the trees inventoried having a height between 8.1 to 12 meters. So about 400 fell in this uh, range and also decreasing as the height increases. Trees with a height of, 20, uh, of more than 20 meters were not commonly found on these sites as they may have been removed prior to construction or after various anthropogenic or naturally caused reasons. Furthermore, the height of the trees inventory may not reflect the age of the trees as they could have been pruned at the crown. Urban trees, specifically those found near overhead wires, are usually pruned and maintained to prevent conflicts with wires, which can affect the height to diameter ratio of a tree. These findings suggest that on city housing properties display the normal conditions of an urban tree. The majority of the trees were likely planted around the same type of the construction with not many mature trees maintained from pre-construction and few planted since. Thus many trees on city housing properties must be well maintained in the next several years to help retain mature trees on the properties and it will be important to replace the aging population with new planting soon. So let us take a look at the type of tree species found on city housing properties. So first off, non-native trees were more commonly found with about 57% found on the city housing properties compared to native tree species that accounted for 43%. It is common for non-native species um, trees to be identified in Hamilton amongst other urban areas, as many species were historically brought over from other countries to be planted as ornamental trees, and non-native trees have until recently dominated the landscaping plants. For example, nori maple, honey locust, white spruce, nori spruce, blue spruce, little leaf linden, and Austrian pine were the top seven tree species found across all 20 city housing properties that had 30 more in trees inventory within those species range and not all of them are native to this area. So Nora maple was the most common species found across all sites with 147 inventoried. Nora maple, which is an introduced species from Europe and Western Asia is an ornamental tree that is planted mainly as a street tree as it provides shade, as you can see in the picture here from the Macassa property. So this is one of our sites that we had inventoried, and this is on the upper Hamilton area. However, it can also threaten current native ma uh, maples in urban environments, such as the sugar maple. And other species of maples found were, as mentioned, sugar maple, red maple, and black maple, which are all native to Ontario, but they were not uh, as commonly planted within these city housing properties. Honey locust was the second most common tree species inventory and was found at almost all city housing properties. This native species is usually distinguished by its pods and thorns found on its trunk. However, thornless honey locust is often planted as an ornamental tree in urban environments. And like the Norway maple, honey locust was also planted as a windbreak and as a shade tree due to its large canopy size. Based on the analysis of the tree species across the 20 city housing properties, it is evident that tree diversity is very low Lack of species diversity can negatively impact urban forest health and can be covered in several ways. For example, through the potential for pests and diseases to completely wipe out the existing trees or by non-native tree species competing for resources with native trees. Therefore, more types of native species should be planted and existing trees should be carefully monitored for diseases. Now we'll take a look at tree condition. So examining a tree by its crown trunk roots can help understand the challenges city trees face. So natural and human cost stress can affect the health of a tree in numerous ways, such as through soil compaction, damage caused by weed whackers, which can result in trunk damage, uh, scars and rot. Trees that were planted too close to a sidewalk, which eventually causes roots to girdle and wires and metal sticks that were forgotten, which can cause bar uh, bark damage. As you can see in the pictures on the top, those were all taken at um, various uh, city housing properties. 
So by assessing the health condition of trees, we can develop more effective tree management and care strategies. So a total of 16 uh, tree condition attributes were examined during the summer 2021 tree inventory, which focused on the crown, trunk, and roots of the tree. And each attribute is ranked from zero to three. So zero being no sign of defect to three having a significant defect. Only the conch attribute is ranked by zero, no conch found, or one conch is found. And if anyone doesn't uh, know what conch is, it is a fungi such as the mushrooms, as you can see in this um, third picture here. So common tree condition attributes had a high, that had a high minor defect. So trees total um, greater than 500 were reduced crown, crown defoliation, trunk scars, and raw ore cavity in the trunk. This da data demonstrate that tree defects are frequent among the tree inventories, but many of the defects recorded were still minor. However, it is important to note that these minor defects can become more significant with age and time. And so preventative maintenance now would improve the health of the trees and reduce the likelihood of defects from becoming more significant and causing damage to structures and people. Exposed roots were recorded in the highest number of trees with moderate and significant defects. Um, you can see, I think it's the uh, last slide or second last uh, attribute. I can't see with my small phone. I'm sorry, guys. Um, so this would be expected as soils and urban environments are prone to erosion and the loss of topsoil. There are many contributing factors to erosion, including human activities, compaction, and poor soil quality to begin at many of these sites. However, also some tree species such as nori maples are prone to having shallow root system. And these were the top common species found and most of them exhibit either a major or significant defect for roots, for exposed roots. So we'll take a look at uh, tree conflicts. So trees can experience a series of conflicts as they grow and require more space. Common conflicts trees can experience is with overhead wires, sidewalks, structures, and other trees. Uh, as well as uh, traffic signs. So trees on city housing properties were assessed into one of three classes. E, existing conflict, P, potential, and no for, N for no conflict. An existing conflict means that the part of the tree is touching or in contact with the obstru uh, obstruction in question, and that the tree or obstruction in, in question is damaged. Trees recorded as having a potential conflict are those where the tree or obstruction will eventually be touching each other within three to five years. And lastly, trees recording as having no conflict are not affected by anything that can affect their growth. So inventory trees did not experience many conflicts with overhead wires and traffic signs. Only 2% of the inventory trees had an existing conflict with overhead wires. Similarly, trees with um, experience fewer um, existing conflict with traffic signs. City-owned street trees usually receive a regular pruning on a five to seven year cycle to prevent these conflicts with wires and traffic signs. Uh, inventory trees that are street trees or those planted near the edge of the properties may be part of this management pruning, resulting in fewer conflicts. The tree con uh, attribute called reduced crown as displayed in the previous slide was recorded as a minor defect for the highest number of trees compared to other tree condition attributes, likely because of this consistent pruning. Inventory trees uh, exhibited more conflicts with other trees, sidewalks and structures, primarily conflict with another tree had a high percentage of existing conflict, which was 39%. Conflicts with sidewalk were the second highest with 13% and conflict with structures were found with the least, 10%. Um, poor planting practices can lead to conflict between trees, structures, and sidewalk. Young trees are often planted too close to structures and their canopy and roots, uh, and as their canopy and roots grow, they eventually encounter uh, another tree, another um, home, or anything else. So having an improved planting strategy would prevent these issues from occurring in the future. And specific trees, such as those with branches that do grow upward or do not have a large canopy cover can be used or planted where conflicts are anticipated. So last but not least, we'll take a look at the City Housing Tenants Survey. So last year from November 15th to December 7th, we had created the City Housing uh, Tenants Survey to understand uh, current tenants' perspectives on trees, shade, access to green space, and other concerns with the help of the McMaster Sustainability course students. A total of 27 tenants had completed the survey, 
which include about one to two from the inventory sites and about one to two tenants from other city housing properties that had not been inventoried as this, this was not limited to those sites inventory. Um, so tenants felt it was important to have access to trees either on their home property or around their neighborhood. As shown in this left figure here, tenants believe that trees help cool outdoor spaces during the summer, provide sound barriers, support the health of other outdoor spaces such as pollinator garden, and most importantly, increase their physical and mental health. To the right, we see the uh, top nine most common answers regarding, uh, I guess my uh, electricity is back, so I might cut off just for a bit as I'm going from data to my Wi-Fi. So let me just close that. Okay, perfect, sorry about that. So while visiting properties during the summer of the 2021 tree inventory, tenants did express their concerns regarding the lack of trimming or pruning of the trees in front of their homes. So some expressed concerns regarding branches falling over their homes during windstorms and snowstorms, leaving them worried for their safety. And for example, this past Saturday, we had or that major storm which caused many trees even around my property to fall onto the uh, roads. We had deaths also occurring across the GTA. So this can be occurring um, concerning when they're not properly uh, maintained and pruned and trimmed. Other concerns regarding lack of pruning come from trees planted too close to high-rise buildings as rodents and other animals climb up the tree, making their way to tenants' balconies and potentially transporting pests and diseases. This had a lot of, a lot of um, high-rise buildings that I had inventoried last year had this concern. Um, all, other, all these concerns need to be taken into account as it is not just for aesthetic reasons, but for safety of the tenants. And although the sample size for the survey was smaller than expected, it still has given some context to the issues and concerns um, that tenants feel regarding trees and green space on their properties. It is evident from conversations with tenants and the surveys that additional resources for professional tree care, pruning and landscaping and shade improvements would be welcome and improve tenants' enjoyment of their homes. Funds dedicated to tree maintenance would address current tree health issues and potential future tree concerns before it is too late. So as uh, we'll go into recommendation. So after gathering all this information, is an import, it is important to make recommendations to the city of Hamilton forestry staff, city housing Hamilton staff, and for any other urban forest management organizations to help better our urban forest. As such, four recommendations had been established. You can read more about it in our, on our summary and full report, which is located on our website, but I'll be sending you a link afterwards. So the first recommendation is to continue to conduct annual tree inventories, implement pilot tree planting events at priority city housing properties, developing tree care and maintenance uh, teams, and to support a community tree engagement strategy. So it is important to continue to conduct tree inventories by involving residents, volunteers, and community groups to collect detailed information and assess current uh, tree conditions, which can also help provide them with information to, to develop a plan for managing trees at city housing properties. And as part of this project, five pilot um, priority tree planting sites were selected for the spring and fall 2022 plantings based on the results from the tree inventory, site visits, and surveys conducted by ourselves and volunteers, city housing tenants' interest and engagement and property manager and tenant requests for tree planting were also factored into the site selection. So as mentioned before, last week we had planted our first pilot site, which was located at Vanier Towers. So this is in the heart of downtown Hamilton. And as you can see to the, on the top right picture, which we believe was a success as many tenants were excited to have four additional caliper sized trees around their properties especially being in a dense urban environment. You, people call it a concrete jungle. They don't see enough trees or you don't have access to you know, the ravines or uh, conservation areas. So trying to bring trees back into the cities is another way to kind of have that connection to nature. And our, also our other two pilot locations that we'll be planting in the upcoming weeks are going to be at 30 Sanford Avenue South, also in downtown Hamilton, and 122 Hatch Street, which is located in Dundas. 
we also recommend that City Housing Hamilton continue to support the development of resident tree care teams at City Housing Properties. Developing a tree care team to take care of these newly planted trees can provide many benefits to the property, such as engaging tenants in monitoring and providing ongoing care for trees, building a sense of community among tenants, enhancing the partnerships and networking for urban forest improvement. Developing a tree care team also helps ensure that the tenants connection to the project and to the urban forest, as we don't want to leave them out, as this is their home, they'll, you know, will be on the property day and night to either walk around, sit, uh, talk with their friends, etc. So we want to have that connection with them and to make sure that they're in on this project from the start to the end. Lastly, we recommend that city housing continues to identify and establish strategies to increase tenant engagement and participation in true related program. Many tenants we spoke to during the study and those surveyed were very keen to support the tree planting and stewardship. City housing tenant and broader community engagement can also be accomplished via informational posters, surveys, training, webinars such as this and uh, tree walks as we did back in April. Uh, which focus all on Hamilton's urban force and the tree equity project, and also to support Green Ventures Canopy for Community program to conduct these engagement strategies. It will also be important to increase the communication between city staff, not-for-profit organization, city housing, uh, Hamilton property manager, and the tenants on their roles and responsibility for tree care management. Engagement will increase the resident's sense of ownership and pride and provide valuable input on matters related to tree products. Uh, projects, actively listening to tenants' needs and concerns regarding issues around tree maintenance and green space on the properties will also improve urban forest outcomes for all. So to end here, so just some takeaways. So urban forests provide a wide array of environmental, economic, and social benefits. However, not everyone can benefit equally from the trees as certain communities or neighborhoods may have fewer trees compared to other neighborhoods. City housing uh, properties experience this tree inequality with some locations having little to no trees found on the property. The Hamilton Tree Equity Project aims to reduce this tree in uh, inequality across Hamilton by supporting City Housing Hamilton measure and assess the condition of their urban forest and tree health on their properties. We know that City Housing Hamilton and the City of Hamilton Forestry Section do not have an up-to-date tree inventory data in place for any of the 1,265 social housing properties. And they do not have an approach for engagement uh, to support tree stewardship and care. So by conducting tree inventories across several of these properties, we were able to determine the, stat, the state of trees on each property, conduct priority uh, tree planting events, and support the development of tenant engagement strategies for ongoing tree care. The study found that tree species diversity is low, and that many trees on city housing properties are experiencing health issues, such as pests and diseases, crown defoliation conflicts that limit the canopy or root growth, and rot and cavities found on trunks and branches. So with our recommendations, we hope to increase our native tree species in our city, improve engagement with tenants, and so forth. So of course, this project wouldn't be possible with our partners and uh, funders, and last but not least, we'd like to thank our tree inventory volunteers last year for taking their time um, out of their busy day to help with this project. And thank you all for joining us tonight. I hope everyone enjoyed this webinar. If you want to get more involved, check out our Canopy for Community page to learn more about this project. We also have a couple of volunteer opportunities in June if ever anyone is interested in getting their hands dirty. We'll be sending out these links after the webinar. Does anybody have any questions? I think, yep, I don't think the electricity will go off for me again. So hopefully that stays good. I'll read the questions out to you, Bella, since you're on your phone. <laughs> so um, Kim has asked, do you have any way to know vandalism of trees? I often see new trees around schools and parks in my neighborhood with snapped branches and trunks and wonder why, how, wonder how common it is with newly planted trees. Mm, they with newly planted trees others they're still trying to establish their roots and kind of get their grip on their surrounding uh, environment 
it can sometimes it can be vandalism depending let's say schools maybe kids are running around or they attempt to climb trees and such that could contribute to it or even um if it's weak squirrels or any other kind of rodents are on it maybe it kind of depends on like if it's consistent in the same area but it's hard to tell it can be hard to tell sometimes yes for sure Something that we've done with these specific plantings is um, before we planted them, we did put, um, you could see in the, the photo of Bella, um, a little sign saying this is a new home for me so that people knew kind of what was happening and what was going on. We've kept these signs there. Um, so we are hoping that that just kind of also establishes a bit of um, kind of uh, like responsibility of the people who live around or, or go through that property to see that, oh, this is a new tree, like it needs its space, it needs to be taken care of. And we've also been able to, like I said, we've got some champions at each site. So hoping that, you know, if they do find any issues with snap, you know, things like that, they can kind of educate people um, as it comes up and hopefully prevent that. And like I said, with all our tree plantings, we always like to go back and monitor them. So hopefully um, if we're able to continue the project in the future, we would be able to update the inventory by also going back to these sites and seeing how the trees are doing after a couple of years. So hopefully we can stay on top of that if any issues come up. And that's part of having the tree care teams is um, we're going to be training the individuals once we have kind of a good group doing a bit of training webinars with them so that they can learn to identify issues as well. Uh, so if they are seeing a common issue come up, then maybe we can come and help and decide if a tree guard needs to go up or anything like that, just to kind of prevent any of those issues as soon as possible. For sure. And then I see Bruno says, very interesting stats, bravo. So thank you, Bruno. Um, yeah, so I don't know if uh, we've got, you can take 10 minutes back of your night. Oh, I see Brianna, okay. Uh, weekdays may be tough for volunteers that work full time. Will there be weekend dates? Um, I'm wondering if you're, oh, like specifically our upcoming invasive species removal. Um, those we are doing during the week uh, sorry, to, uh, to encourage some youth specific, uh, but for on the, um, like after school, so they can kind of have an opportunity to come right after school. We did that last year and it worked really well, uh, but our tree plantings will likely be on the weekends in the fall. So there will definitely be opportunity. Um, and then we do um, different volunteer opportunities at Eco House that can often be during the week or on the weekends. And then our tree care volunteers, um, it's there at the tenant site at the city housing properties. It's flexible to whatever works for them. So like I said, we'll do a training webinar with them or in person, and then they'll be able to do the maintenance whenever works best for them. Um, and we, we are hoping to support them in any way um, for that extra time that they're, they're using weekly to take care of those trees. Yeah, and also for the tree inventory, last year what I learned is that it was a bit better during the day as a lot of people are not home. So during like, as it started to become like four o'clock, five, a lot of the kids came out of like, uh, like summer school or anything, and then kind of having them run around. So it's a little bit harder to kind of measure the tree, look at it, cause some might be on their like front property or back and it might kind of not kind of make them uncomfortable. Like we do explain what we're doing, where we're from, why, et cetera. But it can kind of get a little awkward if let's say they want some privacy too we do let the property managers and tenant support workers and all know that we're coming so it's not like it's a big surprise but we found that it was a bit easier to kind of get it done during the day rather than um, in the evening yeah we did the tree inventory uh july august so there were some people that get the summer off or have time off in the summer they were able to do that and we did open up um if people had their kids with them, they were allowed, like they were able to bring their children with them to do the inventory as well. It's a great learning experience. Um, but yeah, we definitely can consider, I think, kind of the pros and cons weighing if some of the inventory work can be done um, outside of um, regular working hours, like nine to five working hours. But for some people, it did work out if, if they didn't work traditional hours. So it's kind of a, we try to do as much 
different options throughout the year so that, you know, if you are a nighttime worker, you can come during the day, or if you work on the weekends, you can come during the week and, and vice versa. So just hoping to continue to be um, diverse that way so that as many people can come out as possible. And then we just have some thank yous and um, some bravos from Nat and Misty. So yeah, I think uh, if there's no other questions, we can give you seven minutes of your night back. Um, otherwise, yeah, thank you so much. Um, if there's any questions that you have about the project, uh, you can visit the Canopy for Community website and you can see the full summary report that Bella has created, which is really great to kind of, if you want to refresh on some of the things we spoke about, she spoke about tonight. Um, and we will send those links out to you through email so you'll have them. And thank you, Patrick, as well. And yeah, so I'll stop the recording and um, just want to say thank you to everyone and hope you have a great night.